Hey, what's up guys? Hope everybody is well. Just chiming on quickly uh, to introduce my um, podcast guest on episode number 22 of the Rooster Scroll Podcast. Yes, episode number 22, I bring to you uh, Panayoti Costuros. Uh, many of you know him as Pano. Pano is one of those um, people, we talk a little bit about this in the podcast, one of those people that is kind of behind the scenes, that is doing a lot of interesting work connecting the different groups and different community, communities that are emerging in the uh, kind of this, this part of the internet that we all frequent a lot. Uh, he's brought a lot of things to my attention and uh, this is the first time we really got to sit down together and have a discussion. Uh, really beautiful discussion. We resonate on a lot of different areas. We're both Greek American. We both have similar experiences growing up, uh, being an American and spending our summers in Greece. Uh, we talk a lot about deep uh, Orthodox theology stuff. We talk about uh, a lot of different things happening in these disparate communities uh, and are encouraged by what we see emerging uh, in the face of all of the, the challenges that we see today in this world. So uh, love this man. Great conversation with Pano here. So I'm going to give to you episode number 22, Pano Costuros. Thanks. God bless. All right. So um, Panayotis Costuros, welcome to the Rooster Scroll, my friend. Thanks for, for joining me. I'm, I'm finally glad to meet you face to face. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. It's such a pleasure. Um, you're one of those that I've been you know, gotten close with at least virtually over the last couple of years and, and corresponding in different ways. And you show up almost on every kind of uh, a corner of the internet that I find I, I see on there. Um, and it's been very cool kind of get to know you in, in that way. Um, and the way that I kind of kind of think of you is this like, there's all these communities, just disparate communities emerging, and you're kind of like the interstitial tissue that is working behind the scenes, connecting things. Uh, I don't know that a lot of people I mean, I think a lot of people are aware, but notice how that, like, at least I've noticed you pop up, you know, on the, the Jay Dyer group and the Brother Augustine, and then obviously the Symbolic World group is kind of where we connected, um, but also Father Peter Hears, um, a lot of these different areas, um, or th there's a, a few others too uh, that you've, uh, you've um, introduced me to. I think it was, uh, is it the Nicodemus? Um, oh yeah, St. Nicodemus Publications. Yeah. He was, yeah, that one, we could talk about that one for uh, later on as well, but that, yeah, that, that one's very important to me. So, yeah, man. So how did you get, is this something that you're doing intentionally? So how, how do you go about kind of organizing your, your virtual uh, interests in terms of orthodoxy? It's, it's interesting because I, I've always been since I was around five or six years old, I was always drawn <laughs> to for, for, for good or for worse. I know we know you, you can kind of get into the whole technocratic side of things and the um, depersonalization of the screens, right? The kind of beatific vision idea where you're just like staring and insatiably at a screen without actually energizing or activating your agency or that sort. But for me, I was drawn to the screens very young, mainly for just creating different um, videos. I would, I, I, I guess I could say I was vlogging before I knew what vlogging was or <laughs> before it was cool, but I, I would never post anything online. I would just save different clips of me, my family, I would have clips of my papu and, and, and others come in and say hi to the camera and do something. And unfortunately, all those clips have been lost due to many like refreshes and selling our hardware and all that. And my family, they definitely re uh, regret that, especially those with my papu. So I was always drawn to that. And then later on, I guess that was just something that I would continue as well with like my video editing and getting into filmmaking and and that kind of thing but it wasn't until um and we can talk about that later as well i do a uh, filmmaking work and video editing for mm -hmm. i've done one for the symbolic world but there's one i'm working on right now as well okay. but um mainly with the communities though i think that it all began with the saint nicodemus publications because I, I was back when i was in university because i remember i was going through a bit of a hard time like as a, as a lot of people do because you you tend to find out that you're being funneled through the, um, I would call it the machine, where basically you're you're sent out to be stationed somewhere to some corporate job, and that's what the vibe that I I, I got and, and a lot of people got, and that was very soul crushing for me. I'm like, is there really I'll, all these years that I put into my life? It's just going to end up like this, and I see people who are consigned to that fate basically. And it, it, it appeared at that time, I would say it appeared to me that there was no joy or there's no hope 
in a future like that. And that's what led me to the uh, St. Nicodemus publications. It was actually uh, Costa, I forget, I'm going to pronounce his name, but, but um, a spiritual child of Saint, uh, or Saint, excuse me, uh, Elder Athanasios Mitidineos. Mm -hmm. It was based out in Cyprus. His spiritual son, Costa, started um, taking the recordings of his spiritual father, translating them into English and um, releasing different cassette tapes throughout the early 2000s. And then in the late 2000s, he started digitizing them into MP3s and they're scattered on various websites. I can link them. Mm -hmm. uh, Saintnicodemus.com, uh, Pantocrator.gr. There's a Greek and an English section and I think a few others. Um, uh, like the works of Father George Metalinos, he was I, one of my um, uh, friends. Actually, was a student of his, and I know Father Peter Hears was as well. So there's this kind of like underlying insipid connections there, mainly with the Greek Orthodoxy, that uh, it, it exists out there on these obscure websites that most people don't really know about. And I happen to have come across that in my time at university, and it was just a gold mine of resources that you were basically given a full-on catechism and a talk on the spiritual life. Uh, lo looking back at a lot of the things now, you were actually being given this deep theological training uh, without ever realizing that you were. Mm -hmm. And it just breathed new life basically into my soul, I would say. Mm -hmm. And what it's what drove me. What this was, was I discovered all this for me personally, I think it was 2017 or 2018. It was one of the okay. two. And it was, I stumbled across a pile of gold. And I remembered it was in my college group chats, and mostly the group music or the OCF, the Orthodox Christian Fellowship. I would just start spamming links of these new <laughs> uh, recordings that uh, Costa would release. And I don't know, I think a couple of them watched some, but we uh, we did end up watching one of them during one of the meetings. And that was, that was quite cool. <laughs> I'm not sure if people actually watched that or not, but it was fun. Yeah. So that was where I, I, I came across, I, I came across that. And that's what sort of spurned on my uh, spiritual life. I, I began to start repenting for reals, or I should watch my mouth because mm -hmm. I've yet to really begin to repent, but I should say I started to make an effort in my spiritual life yeah. and started to feel the pain and the joys of actually repenting and all that. And just moving on from that, um, I got involved in the whole Jordan Peterson movement. And mainly because most of us now, we're not really given very much of a deep philosophical education. And Jordan Peterson definitely seems to have uh, scratched that itch in some way. Um, and so I think it was around 2000, late 2018, early 2019, that I started to get involved in that material. And I started, I guess that would be my beginning trick in posting comments on the uh, line there it was through uh, Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. And it was, again, via, like most people, via the Jordan Peterson stuff that I discovered Matthew and Jonathan. It was in the biblical lecture series. And it was interesting. I, <laughs> Jonathan didn't really say much during that interview. If you remember, he was mostly silent and I was extremely impressed with Matthew. And then that's what got me into the symbolic world. Mm -hmm. And I think what began there, I know I've went on a, a, a little bit of a tirade there, but I feel like it's important because mm -hmm. when I started to piece together the intuitive noetic strands that you, that Jonathan started to, Jonathan and, and his brother started to lay out for us, one through his book and through the videos, I started to tie that together with a lot of the wisdom from the St. Nicodemus stuff, the streams that I was uh, given, I would feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what began my kind of online ruminations, you can say. Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit later that I discovered, I, uh, I should say, I rediscovered my love for apologetics. I, I remember there was a time in high school where I was super into apologetics, particularly for a uh, against Islam because of what was happening with ISIS. This was around 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. around 2016 there. I was finishing up high school and getting into university. Um, but I took a break from that because it seemed uh, futile for me. Like I didn't seem to be getting very far with a lot of my arguments, mm -hmm. uh, which is then going back to around 2019, as late 2019 is when I discovered Jay Dyer and the whole ortho sphere, <laughs> the ortho bro apologetic sphere. Mm -hmm. And that to me was, it felt like at the time, and I, we had this discussion a while back, I, I feel like, and you can chime in here as well, if I'm misrepresenting this, but 
I feel like with the whole symbolic world and what is being provided for for the the viewers in that sense is sort of this like noetic boot camp mm-hmm. where you're taken out of you're taken out of this kind of gnostic state where scientism and materialism forces you to look at the world in this really arrogant perspective like how you're going to look at the world as if you're not a part of the world i mean that's that's just silly if you really think about it as a, yeah. a human as a human person a human hypostasis right mm-hmm. so t- taking that and actually allowing you just to settle into yourself as a human person mm-hmm. and letting the creation letting all the the logi we can say funnel into you and allowing you to participate in that like you would as a child we didn't even have to have words for it as a child but it's allowing you to do that and then going to the apologetic side the um more deeper philosophical side that you find with the ortho uh, bro community the ortho bro community with jay dyer and all that you're Mm -hmm. given a very advanced set of terms and um conceptual patterns with which you can actually take that experience that you have from the symbolic world and actually give it concrete form, right? That you can mm-hmm. use to argue with. There's a danger on both sides, right? And we, I think that's something that we do. I know Jordan Peterson would speak about it oftentimes with the, uh, the balance of the creative and the rigid, right? You have that idea with the Tao, um, with the Tao or excuse me, uh, not the Tao, but the, the yin and the yang symbol. Mm-hmm. And I do feel that these two communities, they seem to act in that way. They tend to complement each other quite brilliantly. And I find that if I, if I'm too, if I get too heady, like I usually am, if you ask people I know, Mm -hmm. uh, if I get too heady with just trying to study the theology and the apologetics, then I would sort of take a break and focus back in on more of the symbolic world stuff, as well as um, my spiritual life too. So I would tend to, switch over to watch some symbolic world content and focus in on back to the Nicodemo stuff and even stuff from like priest monk cosmos and orthodox talks right the type of material that's designed to sort of really rip apart your soul so that you can repent more fervently and heal yourself more fervently mm-hmm. and i feel that if i if i would in, and, and indulge in that for a little while then i feel like i would actually be more prepared to go back and start articulating this transfiguration that's happening to me Mm -hmm. and i feel that being able to jump back and forth in these two communities allows for this uh freshness on both sides where if i'm if i'm on a video let's say a clip from one of lisa and brad's uh or lisa and a few other people i forgot their names but Mm -hmm. shout out to them on the clips channel what they do is really fantastic i'm watching something if i'm watching something there like one that comes to mind is the um talk that jonathan had with um was it pints with Aquinas or one or no, it was, it was one of the law. It was Lofton something. Mm-hmm. Chris Lofton, I think is his name. Yeah. I think so. The, the Roman Catholic where they would have the discussion about um, like, why can't we express, why can't we image God, the father? Right. And then to me at that point, I had just come off of some reading from Basil or some studying of the, the uh, hypostatic properties of the persons and grounded in scripture. Right as well as having come out of Holy Thursday. <laughs> That's a mm-hmm. central theme of gospel readings there. I would just go into the comment section and just tie together and say, well, not really. You're not supposed to do that because Christ is imaging the Father. That's mm-hmm. He's always done that from, from all eternity. And so being able to use these extremely precious words that comes from our saints and that I would say Dyer and all the, the crew there do a really good job of presenting that uh, in a philosophically sound way, but being able to bring that over to, uh, while at the same time having a proper, proper, I should say, continually developing symbolic worldview, I feel that's quite interesting. I'm not sure if I answered your question. It was a bit of a haze, but yeah, well said. Actually, I think that was that was great. Um, how old are you? Twenty four. Twenty four. Wow, really? Man, I thought mm-hmm. you were. Uh... You're you're wise for your years, man. Holy smokes! So, what, oh, where'd you go? To, where, yeah, right. Where'd you go to university? I went to Purdue University, mm-hmm. uh, closest to me. But I was very thankful for it. Actually, I had a, I studied computer science there. Got my bachelor's, and uh, I'm at a point now. I'm not sure exactly how and when and if I should continue, to, especially with this whole um, globo situation that's happening. And mm-hmm. 
the demon. I, I like to, <laughs> I, I like to call the staboos. I, I like to call them the demons darts. Actually, I, I, I was reading the prayers at Compline, and even the Mother of the Light prayer book has this. Mm -hmm. But a common theme that you'll see in the Orthodox prayer life is, "Oh Lord, protect me from the demons darts." I read that, and I'm like, please, that's right. a symbolism happens moment right there. I'm like, this, this is real. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, for that yeah. thing, so. I'm in a bit of a stasis right now, but I guess supp supplementing that with my own study and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful to have the conversations with uh, JP whenever I do, and I feel like my brain is expanding there. So, what do you mean by but stasis? Yeah. Did I say? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm in a bit of a stasis. Oh, so yeah, like uh, not sure exactly how. I mean, the future is always uncertain now more than ever. So stasis in with regards to my my education, I should say, uh, well, whether or not I should continue doing what I'm doing now or sh I should find some other way to be grafted to an inst like an educational institution or a hierarchy of some sort that would propel me forward. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I feel like I, I feel as if the myself and many others are being kept in that stasis i know uh especially i mean my what's happening right now at holy cross for example where they're they're making the stabus mandatory to go to seminary and that's mm. been extremely yeah. problematic and because i'd considered at one point studying um theology at seminary uh, because it's something that's i'm really passionate about we well, can get an exemption you can get an exemption. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they're, they're making it mandatory for all of all college students, mm -hmm. essentially, which is bizarre, you know, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you know a good doctor friend, in a sense, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you can get an exception, a medical exception, you can get in a religious exception, actually, you know that? To go to seminary? That's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, my God. I didn't, I didn't even think about it like that. Um, that's crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. uh Geez, I didn't even think about it like that. But, uh, you know, in terms yeah. of uh, work, my, my wife works at the hospital, but I think it's school as well. Uh, so it's, I was talking to my wife. I'm like, oh, you, you better hurry up and become orthodoxy then now because we have, a, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, that's uh, that's it's a it's a strange thing. And it's not even like, you know, the, the case of whether the um, the jabbies are, um, you know, deleterious to this extreme. Mm -hmm. Like they might be actually like there's a lot of I'm really. For some reason, I'm very uh, attracted to learning about what these things are, and mm. there's you a lot. Should. Of, I mean, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, information coming out on how they, um, at least these early vaccines, these early kind of jabbies that are coming out, they're using this this technology, which is quite brilliant, the mRNA technology, and but they've rushed these initial um, these initial vaccines so quickly that they. Um, they didn't have the proper testing. And the, the issue that's coming out now is that, the, you know, the spike protein that's being um, encoded specifically is supposed mm -hmm. to anchor in the arm when, when the, um, when it's given, when the shot is given, right. But it's pieces of it are, are, are coming off and are being distributed through the organs. And there's a lot of different, uh, you know, material, like not, it's not the actual spike protein, but it's a lot of weird stuff that's happening with that. And, and it's just common sense wise, it doesn't make sense that, that this should be promulgated. So, uh, universally for something that is not, uh, it's, you know, not it's interesting. It's interesting because this brings to mind the theme of the anomia or the law, the spirit of lawlessness that particularly father Seraphim and Rose expounds upon this, uh, uh, from, I think it was first or second Thessalonians where St. Paul talks about the spirit of lawlessness abounding. And it makes me think, well, on the one hand, could this be something and the more conspiratorial and, could very well be right but are they purposefully aware of the effects and then releasing it on people knowing that this is going to have the effect or are they just not caring like you're just throwing caution at the wind and saying well we're possessed by this crazy anomia this crazy spirit of lawlessness and saying well let's see what shit happens perhaps right and see what mm -hmm. happens to these people or is it a mix of both i mean it might not be um because really i feel that the spiritual state of, we discussed this prior to the recording, I feel, but the spiritual state of the cosmos at this point, like the heavens do seem to be falling. And what kind of effect would that have on people who have um, this 
kind of authority over people's uh, bodies, particularly like the health institutions, for example, right? I mean, what what kind of assaults are they going through? Mm-hmm. I'm thinking from like a spiritual perspective, like what kind of plani or prelest are they uh, faced with that yeah. maybe we don't even understand? Well, I don't think they do, right? I think whether it's the, mm-hmm. the just the momentum of the perverse incentive structures through mm-hmm. corporate and government, you know, you know, mega um, complexes, or if it's mm-hmm kind of a more conspiratorial view, I think they know not what they do. And I think they're captured exactly. by, they're just captured by this, uh, this momentum. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. And it's, it's, you see with Dr. Dr. Fauci now, um, there was this FOIA request that came out, you know, from Buzzfeed and a couple others that uh, these emails came out and it's like, they're, they're scapegoating him, right? Like they're scapegoating him in a sense where, you know, he's responsible for the role that he's played, but he's a mm-hmm. figurehead. You know, when he goes, they'll, they'll have someone else there, right? And it keeps us, yeah, exactly, keeps us from looking deeper in, into what's, you know, the real, the real rot at the core of things is this that just the general relationship between science, government, and and capital, in a sense, which is uh, the the reckoning from the consequences of what's happening is hard to imagine, but it's kind of happening. Um, so I, I don't know you know, what the motivations are. And you could, you know, I drive myself crazy thinking of, you know, do they know? And, or is it just a financial thing? And it's regardless of whatever it is, it's, I think it's this idea of, of they know not what they do and this being completely unrooted to any kind of uh, ideas of a, of a higher power or, or you know, it's just, uh, it's an onslaught. Uh, there's nothing good from it in that perspective. So there's, yeah. yeah, for real. I mean, and especially when you watch the media coverage of all this, this is something I'm very thankful for, actually. My uh, one of my more nascent passions, not not passions as in you know spiritual passions, but life passions, but uh, is actually filmmaking. I've been doing uh, particularly film editing, CGI uh, mm-hmm. for a long time since I was about uh, was I it was 2008 that I started doing After Effects, but it was a couple of years before that, so I must have been around 10 years old or older when I started getting involved in that and uh it was just a passion of mine that i've had for quite a long time i entered into uh, some film competitions in middle school and and uh at university i actually my time in university i helped put together uh a four-part miniseries i think it was about th- between three and four hours total when you watch it but based on dc comics characters and i was super proud of that that was mm-hmm. like a film school a film degree and a half for me right yeah and being being involved in the production um, I wasn't so much involved in the writing. I was more so involved in kind of delineating a, a coherent story structure. Mm-hmm. But being involved in the production, being on set, uh, putting shots together, helping find creative ways to uh, repurpose shots. And then my main area of domain is the uh, the editing bay, mm-hmm. placing clips together and trying to, you really learn how to take shots, to, uh, how to take different um all the different aspects of of these shots right the the uh focal length the 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 focus in on the camera right the mm-hmm. the timings of the of the performances of the actors and all these different things and you and you learn how to sequence them together in just the right way and even fudge them being being able to fudge them in such a way where what is being presented in the final product isn't it wasn't really reflected in the script or in the performance but it's something that you're placing in there you're placing your own stamp to help emphasize uh, mm-hmm. this idea in the story and having gone through that and been and, and producing the series i look i i look at the news now and i'm like oh yeah they just shot that after the event or yeah this was faked or or yeah they manipulated this <laughs> section there to go uh to make to influence this like it's basically it's basic composition and basic theater mm-hmm. and you do get a sense of that in the movie nightcrawler uh if you've seen that before that one's it shows cases that really well mm-hmm. but it's all deception and it's it's just theater that's mm-hmm. forced into you now yeah or i mean even you read writings from like saint john chris Austin, for example and we talk about like avoid the theaters stay home and read your scriptures and pray and can you imagine what he would say now where the theater is everywhere and for the worst and i know this might be a little cliche but it does it does terrify me. I've, I've experienced it. How would this affect children? Mm. Really? When you're constantly bombarded with theater. Yeah. How does that influence your discernment growing yeah. up? 
Yeah, I that's mean, a that, that's a uh, you know I have three small kids and uh, yeah I talked with um, you know Father Seraphim uh, Aldea and um, mm -hmm. before we actually didn't talk about this during the or did we a little bit and just corresponding through email I asked them about you know um, his perspective on children and technology and this kind of onslaught that's that's happening and. You know, he's like, James, I can't, you know, I don't have any kids. I don't know if I, I can speak to that. I mean, he's like, I can't speak to any. He said, trust, he said, trust them. Right. He said, trust them. And trust I was them. like, mm -hmm. hmm. And then I was thinking, you know, it, you can't stop them. Right. You can't, you can take them out of the environment as best you can. Right. But you can't, uh, it's what we're going into. Right. So I think that uh, kind of leverage, get them involved in, in prayer, right. And, and reading the scripture and developing that discernment. And they're going to develop capacities that we don't have to, you know, develop that discernment in the environment that they're going to be, you know, coming up in, in a sense, you know, so I don't know, there's, I think there's a happy medium between sure, you know, trying to keep them away from it as much as you can, but also, you know, showing them how to swim, show them how to navigate and, and training the, their, their, uh, their ability to, to make sense of things in a sense, but it's, you know, my kids are always looking for the iPad and whatnot. A lot, it doesn't matter what the show is, even if it's educational or a lot of times it is, um, it, it doesn't matter. It's just the, the way that this technology is just interacting with them. It's changing them. But, uh, you know, there's both good and bad to that, you know, uh, and I think we have to kind of train the good as best we can. Um, uh, and a lot of, lots of prayer, uh, you know, that, that goes with that, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really just a, different environment so rapidly than it was just when when I was growing up you know um and I, I you know I can't imagine what the environment's going to continue to be like but who knows man you know yeah uh, but I like the idea of trust them in terms of uh you know uh you know, give them the ability for you to trust them you know give them that ability in a sense but uh, it's not a, there's no easy answer that's one of probably the biggest questions concerns that I have in conversations that I have th with the channel and with the podcast is, is trying to discern how to navigate that for sure. Yeah. And again, I don't have children. So <laughs> yeah, if, if that uh, blessing were to ever arrive, then maybe I'll have a better answer to my own question there. But yeah, now, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, it is, you do think about it too. Like we like, like even just now when I was in that kind of downcast state there we do forget that god does actually provide the the, the amount of grace that you need for your salvation mm -hmm. and so i would imagine i can't imagine but you guess you're right i would trust that god would give your children the the opportunities and the insight to properly to make proper use of what was given them so yeah you're right yeah. about that but i think it's it's um it's you, know, you got to be careful to who you say this to or how people would take it. Trust it doesn't mean you know let them be. You know, uh, it's yeah. you know your our, your role as a parent and a, and a guardian is super important. So that trust comes with uh, that the love and support and the care and the guidance is absolutely necessary. But that trust piece just kind of hit me in a specific way, um, where you know a lot of the the root roots of the uh, kind of the issue of in, many generations, recent generations is the kind of helicopter parenting of the eighties and nineties, where you kind of these ultra hyper safe spaces where, you know, kids, when I was growing up, you know, we used to go play outside we'd play manhunt, we'd get in trouble, we'd fight, we'd do all that in a sense. And now, you know, that, that has kind of been taken away uh, in the late eighties, nineties, it really came into the fold where, you know, even when the child's going to college, you would have the parent that would go meet with the teacher and, you know, kind of make sure things are okay in a sense. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it goes back to this, this, this yin and yang thing, right? The, the left and the right hand, you can be too overly rigid and you have the sins of the right hand, or you could be, you know, too detached and you have the sins of the left hand. Um, I think that that big, big piece is trust and, and prayer and worship and, and plugging in as best you can to, uh, to tradition. Um, it's just hard. Like, what is that? What does that even mean? What is, what does tradition in the future look like? You know, it's hard to yeah. do that um you know and it's it's interesting okay oh, yeah go ahead no no go ahead i was gonna ask you um i know you just went to the the trad forum right oh yes i did yeah mm -hmm. maybe we can get into that a little bit but just before we do maybe we can get into um you're you're 24 you were born and raised in that area or no right and i you know, was born in uh athens and i remember i don't remember this but i well this i don't remember exactly when but i i know when i was very young i think it was a few months old my mom and my dad, they um, 
came over here to Northwest Indiana where my dad grew up because he had better work opportunities here. Mm -hmm. And my mom, she spent her whole life in Greece. She was about, how old was she when I was born? She, I think she was 20 or 21 or 22. Mm -hmm. And she spent her whole life in Greece and she just came over here with my dad with a little baby. And she didn't have anyone at that time to confide in. I mean, she had my, she had my dad's mom or my grandma, but they were still new at the time, right? She mm -hmm. had to do a lot of things herself. And uh, yeah, that, and growing up, uh, oftentimes my dad felt bad and he would, he, uh, for pulling her away. But at the same time, he wanted me and her to be able to go home to Greece a lot. So for the early parts of my life, I think every summer between two and three months at a time, depending on how um, the year, I, it was mostly two, I believe. But for a good part of the year, he would have um, me and her go back uh, to Greece almost every year. Yeah. And it was the experience of that was um, I'm very thankful for that, actually, because growing up, there was always I did feel that there was I, I got along really well with the people around me. I went to school here. But even then, I did feel that there was something a little bit um, different uh, with my school friends as opposed to my the friends at my church or my Greek school. Right. There was this uh, bond that you have. So, yeah, but I was thankful to be exposed to that, exposed to the language when I was young, exposed to the culture, even the subtle, the subtleties that you get by being around my <laughs> Bapu and my Yaya, mm -hmm. just in the, in the Choryo, I, I would uh, travel to um, well, Candila, which is closer to Corinth. And then we have uh, Agnadia, which is on my mom's side, which is further up north, uh, outside the, uh, forget what the port city is called, but the port city that takes you to Skiathos and Skopelos, the two important islands there but mm -hmm. yes yeah, so i would go up there i would also the, the main area was in athens uh yerica mm -hmm. a little division there so yeah i have a very similar upbringing so my my parents moved here my mom was very young maybe 19 mm -hmm. 8 19 and they both moved here um and you know my mom actually I couldn't imagine. They both here didn't learn the language at all. You know, my dad drove a cap a taxi in the Hoyo up in North Greece, where we're from, and he sold his medallion and he took the money that he had. And, you know, his, his mom and his dad, they came here to, to America. And, you know, over the course of being here, they had, you know, my family had six miscarriages. You know, I was, oh, the, wow. seventh. I was the seventh, like, you know, the, like, I could just imagine not knowing the language. They both worked in restaurants as cooks and waitresses. And, you know, learn the it's like Saint Fortini like and like the seventh, the seventh husband being Christ. You know, finally. Yeah, yeah. Got it yeah. I might. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I took a. You know, um, I found an, a, an opportunity. I'm like, you know, here we go, seventh. If they're trying again, let's get in there. So you know, popped in and, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, my I grew up with my papunya. Yeah, they were with me most of the time. My parents worked in the restaurants. And they ended up, you know, getting and owning restaurants. But I would go to Greece every summer for two to three months, usually between school, right? And my mm -hmm. fondest memories are being in the Choryo with, with in the deep relationships and that I still have with my friends there that I built. The most wonderful experiences and memories are going there for the summer. Uh, it, and yeah, it gives you that. a different perspective on the way life is here by going there and living life there, especially in the Choryo. And I have family in Athens and I have family in Thessaloniki. But most of it was... Uh, up in North Greece, kind of Iraklia Ceres area, about an hour and a half from Thessaloniki uh, in the, in the Choryo there. And it's just a different rhythm to life and a just different, uh, you know, uh, and it's some of the most beautiful experiences that I've, that I had. Um, and I stopped going every year and then I'd go every two years. And now, you know, with life happening, you know, I, last time I've been there was 2014 and uh, next time I'm going is next, next summer, God willing. Same. That was the last time I went was in 2014 yeah. as well. That was, yeah. it's been seven, more than seven years now. Yeah, it's about seven years. But I remember, I mean, one of my favorite experiences now in the Horyo was you're given a glimpse of a real, like, miniature unit of people mm -hmm. as opposed to something, because now we're immersed in globalism, especially now mm -hmm. with everything. So, like, you drive up in the Horyo, right, and you get all these stairs, like, mm-hmm. It's like everyone's crazy. looking at you, everyone's looking at you like you're like an alien. And in fact, my brother, actually, my little brother, 
uh, I was, this happened, I think when I was, I think 17 or a little bit younger, my brother was uh, 13 or 14 at the time. And he felt really nervous. He's like, I'm not an alien. I'm a person. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, but that's no, you're not to them. You're, yeah. you're, you're, an, you're exceptional, man. You are an alien to them. And that yeah. was my awakening too. I mean, I forget exactly. I, I know Matthew talks about that, but the idea of like the stranger, right? So at yeah. that point, I was a stranger to them. But, but you're as not soon a full as stranger, you're not a full I'm stranger. Not. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I had the same experience. Um, yeah. you know, uh, not to cut you off, but it's like you know when I went. No, you're good. But I would go there in the '90s, right? And I was 14, 15 years old, and uh, they would kind of like the girls would look at you like kind of like you're a superstar because you're you're from America, like in the mm. '90s and whatnot. And they'd ask my friends would ask me stories about you know, do you have to have a knife with you when you're walking <laughs> the streets? Because they knew I was from Florida, but they think in Miami Vice, right? And it's just a <laughs> It's such a, I had that same experience where they're like, oh, he's from our village, but he lives in America. So he's one of us, but he's also, you know, and there were some kids that were more, you know, hesitant to hang out, uh, but not really, you know, there were, they were mm -hmm. more, they would hang out and engage and be cool. But they, I, you could tell there was like, you know, that, that unit, you know, you've broken out of the unit and now you're coming back. So I had that, that same experience yeah. that you're, you're speaking of there. Well the best part too is when you have the unapologetic uh yeah yeah this who they come up to you like you're entering my you're entering my nest my kingdom and they just flat out ask you hey Piosise, Piosise, yeah. who's are you yeah like and i'm, I'm thinking in my head now like you, you know the um, the the delineating chain of uh, meaning from, mm -hmm. from from matthew's book and you have like a uh, an external piece that doesn't fit with the rest. And then when you find out how it links, then the light funnels through. Yeah. That was that kind of symbolic experience I had there. It's like, <laughs> who's are you? It's like, oh, I'm a, I'm a step with the, uh, uh, yeah. news. He goes, oh, I see, I see, I see, okay. Yeah. And immediately like a light switches. And within 10, 20 minutes, we're getting meals handed to us from all the villagers because yeah. they found out how you join in this, uh, this system that they have. But they don't think about it the way that I've, I've laid it out. It's deeply yeah. intuitive. And, and it goes from this, uh, yeah. you know, this questioning of, you know, uh, which means whose kid are you in a sense? And then you mm -hmm. give them like uh, the last name and then they have to call, obviously, you know, your grandpa and whatnot. And mm -hmm. then it goes from like that questioning to Philotomo immediately, where it's like, come in, you know, and you're literally exactly. family immediately, like completely engulfed in, inside the, uh, you know, the unit, just like that. Uh, that's so interesting. I've never heard anybody speak about that experience that I've had like that. So mm -hmm. uh, that's probably why we're yeah. spirits, man. That's very cool. Uh, and a, a lot of other experiences of just going out like, uh, you know, the, every store had its own quality to it because it's not a it's not a, a chain or anything. So there was mm -hmm. there wasn't even a supermarket in the, there was one supermarket, but it was kind of like, you know, random stuff in there. It wasn't like, you know, but you would go to the Furno and get your bread and you would go get a Bugatza at the same place there. And, you know, and the places are still there. You know, and then yeah. you go to the, the Cafe Neo and play Electronica, you know, we play video games and then, uh, you know, we'd stay out until late and just walk home, uh, you know, and then and it's uh, such a wonderful experience. And and I go back now to the Horyo and I don't know, you know, I haven't been back in 2014, but you know, I know that there, a lot of the globalism has has, in, you know, infiltrated even the villages there pretty significantly. And I know that there was like drugs that came through heroin and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, my God, like. I don't know if it's like that anymore, but maybe 10 years ago, I heard a mm -hmm. lot of that, that stuff was happening. Um, and then the whole idea there was to, you know, leave the Jorio and you go to the city, right? Um, but there seems to be kind of a, an outflux back into the, the Jorio now, uh, in a sense, yeah. back into the village. Um, but it's it's such a... And like a lot of people, I, I, I know my papu, he goes back. It's funny now, actually. Well, they usually go back about... I forget my the intervals correct, but once every couple months they go back from their house in Athens to Agnevia, then the mountainous area in the north. Mm -hmm. And now actually my papu he caught COVID mm -hmm. and he's he's self-isolating. And he called up my mom and he's like, Oh, oh it must like I'm so peaceful now. This is the best. I don't get to deal with people's garbage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my my grandma <laughs> my grandma would uh I always sit in the veranda outside on the, on the, uh, you know, I love that veranda. Like I'm a, when I used to meditate a lot, I would always go, uh, used to go to the most favorite place and it would always be on the, on the, you know, right on the, on the porch there sitting on the bed. Hold on. Yeah, buddy. Oh, oh sorry. It's got a little intruder there. And I would ask my, my, my sit there with my grandma and she would tell me, Isihia, Isihia. You know, she would tell me about Isihia and I didn't, 
you know, I knew what she was talking about was quietness. And then yeah, when just, I, yeah. When yeah, I learned about calm. the Hesse cast, you know, the Hesse cast, I didn't even put together that that's what the word meant in the sense when I was reading about the Hesse cast and I'm like, oh man. And it's like, uh, gives you an, an insight into what Isihia is. It's like the, the, the peace of the soul, like, it, like, like, I don't know, hisop or, you know, there is this like deep piece of how things are in a sense. Um, so I, it's, it's something that I, you know, I'm, I'm, grateful to have experienced and know that that's available or that's out there or that exists that type of mm -hmm. piece you know it's it's a different type yeah. of piece i think especially now with everything being in motion more than ever right it's mm -hmm. something that that could be actually a way in i mean it could be a danger uh you could turn hesychasm into another kind of spirituality right but mm -hmm. at the same time it, i think it can for people who are looking for it and they do have a love of Christ, it might actually be a nice way into the real spiritual life if, if their hearts are pure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, so you talked, you said, mentioned a couple of times of uh, actually being, you know, able to repent. What, what is that? And, and is that something you think you can, you can will yourself to get to a place where you can repent authentically? And what does that look like? You'd say. Um, I don't think you can... Ultimately, it comes from God. He's the one who allows you to. He gives you the necessary grace and courage to, to rip out all the poison that's been infused into your heart, right? And that hurts. It really does hurt. But I think what you can do is show, showcasing that, it, that it, initial drive or initial desire to at least begin that, that healing process. And I guess by actually repenting, I never actually considered at one point the... Uh, the full weight that our faith actually places on us to, to, to become like gods and like mm -hmm. what theosis actually means. And that's, you're given this faith, you're given this, I mean, the deposit of faith, we talk about it. I know Catholics talk about the deposit of faith at a certain point in time in history, which is true, but we understand baptism as our personal Pentecost and that light was deposited in you a certain X years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's taking that deposit, that, that participation that was expected of you to cultivate and actively seeking out that cultivation. So I guess by actually repenting, I was coming to this realization that, wow, I, I really need to start taking myself seriously. I, I, I have to do my own personal economy, my own housekeeping of my, my kingdom, my heart, my passions. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I think what brought that on for me was the, um, uh, Part of it was fear. It was, uh, I forget where I, I, I heard this, but the, the idea that when your soul is separate from your body in that intermediary state, you will have perfect memory. Like every moment of your life will be sorted and displayed out in front of you, uh, easy to see. Mm -hmm. And that terrified me, thinking, wow, I'm not even, I mean, in, in my 20s now, and that would terrify me now if I died now. But what I need to really do to repent so that I that wouldn't sear my conscience, right? And that so part of it was fear, and the other part of it was that motivation, uh listening to recordings of Saint Paisios and the uh uh heart-rending lectures by Costa about joy, the fact that Christians are called to be joyful. And I'm like, well. I don't feel joyful right now. What, what, what do you mean? What kind of joy? And I think it was a section from his St. Paisio spiritual councils on something very simple, but we often forget about it. But the, you mentioned Philotima, but the, the sacrificial love that one has for his neighbor, which allows mm -hmm. the grace of God to not only indwell you, but the grace of God actually begins to heal and sort out like kind of like a magnet. When you place a magnet in uh, a bunch of uh, pieces of metal, how everything just Mm -hmm. magic or automatically sorts itself out like that that's the effect that god's grace has on you and the world around you and that definitely moved me and i said okay well i'm going to have to humble myself near a priest and i'll allow this seek to to fix it so i guess really repenting was becoming aware of the need to repent becoming aware of the fact that you're not what God wants you to be, mm -hmm. right? You are far from that. And, you know, St. Paul says you, you were bought with a price. I mean, my, whether even most of our ancestors knew it or not, they participated in bringing you forth so that you could become a God. 
mm-hmm. uh, by grace, not by nature. And there's no other point to it besides that, just to sit here and to lounge around and to abscond with, with different resources and exploiting people. I mean, no, we're, we, we were brought into this world liturgically from our parents at that proper union, and we're called to continue that in every morsel of our being. Mm-hmm. And to realize that sounds great, but I have to, I have to, I, I have to begin like removing all the impediments that prevent that kind of union. And, and you do. I remember when when you get these tiny moments of of grace, these small like tiny morsels of manna, you can say to use the mm-hmm. Exodus term, and you do get that s- small glimpse of peace, tranquility, and theosis, and what that's like. I had it for maybe once or twice in my life. It didn't last very long. It was very small. And I long for it now. I really do. <laughs> so I, mm-hmm. I've been on a dry period for a while. Yeah. But this, the kind of love that you have for the people around you to the point where you're brought back to that state of childlikeness mm-hmm. that you were when, you know, you watch the old recordings, cassette recordings of you when you were a child. And that part of you reactivates and people feel edified by being around you, not necessarily because of you, but because God allows that mm-hmm. change to happen in you. Yeah. And it allows you to be a, a proper human being, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's very well said. And um, just as an aside, I was, as a kid, I was always the one that uh, was recording. I was always the one recording oh. the, uh, you know, the gatherings, everything, you know, um, I recorded my uh, sister's christening. Um, and, uh, I recorded, she was actually dancing and uh, she fell and hit her head on the slab. She had to get stitches and whatnot. Like they're all mostly gone now. All those recordings are all on VHS. So that's, that's interesting that, uh, early on we were drawn to this technology, um, that is now kind of everywhere. Um, and it's, it's interesting that this kind of idea came to mind is, you know, these, these truths that are, uh, are coming into the world now are, are being manipulated. Uh, the idea that you are God or we are all gods is so prevalent in the new age community. Mm-hmm. And it's the exact, it's such a perversion of this idea of theosis because it, 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 it necessitates or instantiates this spiritual inflation of the ego, the spiritual ego. And I had it, I felt it pretty, you know, pretty intensely, not while it was happening. Cause you don't feel it while it's happening. You can only reflect on it and be like, Whoa, Holy cow. You think you're doing so things are so right and, and good for, you know, uh, for others in a sense, to the point where you can think that you're helping others heal themselves, but you're in this state of pre and, and with all of these, this, this new world that we're, you know, that's emerging, all of these truths that are, you know, fundamental are even more susceptible to be manipulated. And I think that's, what's happening with, uh, this idea of being spiritual rather than religious and, you know, ascension and the whole new age, new age movement of, uh, of becoming a God, you are actually God in a sense. And it's, it's not the same thing as deification at all. Uh, yeah, just even the way they say it, like you are a God, like, what is that, that inflection? I feel that it, it, it spurns on pride and the basis of it is well, humility, trust in the will of God, the will of the logos or, elevating yourself through pride and it, it sounds simple i know but mm-hmm. it it all i feel goes back down to that and it's i i do feel too a lot of people are hurting today because they sense the deliturgization the dissolution of everything and one of the ways that they feel that they can hold that up is through i mean we you can talk about will to power but um forcing it all to work together through pride mm-hmm. and that's something that i We've all experienced it to some degree. I mean, you can't not experience it. And you mm-hmm. see people around you who they fall prey to it occasionally. And it's yeah. it's a difficult, it's a difficult form of prelest to get out of. And yeah. It's yeah. the same people that say we are all gods that, that don't believe in God. They believe in the universe. They'll say, you know, the universe is uh, the universe is um is conspiring for your favor. And like if mm-hmm. you sit there and, and I, I was in that 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 boat a little bit, it's like, well, what do you mean the universe? Like, what do you mean by the universe? You mean like the stars and the galaxies, like the physical structures? What do you mean? What do you mean by the universe? What, what are we saying here? Like, you know, how is that anything? Um, it's inspiring and and whatnot. And if you just press a little bit, that whole edifice just falls of of you know uh, all yeah. of the superficial language in a sense. Um, but it's uh it's difficult to navigate and it's uh it's difficult to 
you know, in, in every, in, in every, any sense that every religion is on, is actually celebrated except Christianity. Like, you know, you can be a Buddhist and it's cool. You could be a Taoist and it's mm -hmm. cool. You can be a, a native American. And it's super cool. You know, uh, Aborigine, you know, uh, Aboriginal um, religions, shamanism is really big right now. And it's like everything, but Christianity really. And it's like interesting. And uh, one, some solace that I take in that is that, um, you know, this is, this, it was written what's happening now. It's, mm -hmm. it's comforting to, to like, to look at all the things that are emerging are what has been told to us. So it's like, it's almost more comforting to have that nihilistic perspective than to have this seeing the disintegration of, of the world, but knowing that it's, it was written in a sense where it's like, Oh, it's, it's almost like, yeah, okay. You know, it's verifying actually some, some deeply held, you know, uh, you know, religious, you know, tenets in a sense. And um, we were talking about repentance and it's like the rules are, easy to discern i mean there's there's essentially 10 of them right if you follow the 10 commandments right that they're not their children can understand them pretty easily right but mm -hmm. to follow them is it's, it's almost impossible right and and it's like if people don't realize and i don't realize a lot of times when you know just telling little lies that are insignificant are if you can cut that out right and then you know if you start following the commandments and living like christ right and actually doing that like it'll be, it becomes easier to follow them. Right. And, and, but you know, these little things that you're not aware of pop up of telling stupid lies or doing this stupid thing or becoming jealous of someone for, for whatever reason. And then you become aware of them. And then, you know, through the grace of God, you can work through them and then they go away. Like the intensity of them go away, like the jealousy of somebody, a neighbor getting a new car or a new house or a, a you know, a pool or whatever it may be, you know, that starts to, to the, the intensity starts to die down. And then, you actually feel happy for people that are doing well in a sense. And then for people that, uh, you know, are used to just trigger you for me, it was, I'd be triggered by people on the news, uh, especially uh, pharmaceutical commercials. Like they would trigger me every time I was like, don't watch them. Like uh, something, somehow it'll, a commercial will pop on. It's about a, some stupid pill. And it was on the, you know, there'd be like three or four of them uh, on one commercial break. And I'm like, God, this is so ridiculous. Why would it's just accepted that it's okay to have a pharmaceutical commercial on like something you discuss with your physician. But anyways, like you can kind of have yeah. uh, for, you can kind of forgive or pray for these people that you're, you know, that are, that used to inspire vitriol in you, like, you know, different political pundits or whatever it may be. So it's actually mm -hmm. a, a, it's a beautiful process, um, but it's hardest thing to do. Orthodoxy is hard. It's hard. I mean, to love your enemies. If you think of love, I mean, I was I was reading, um, not fully at this point. I realized I might have to wait a little until I can really dive into Father Saint Dimitrius Daniloy. He's been one of my favorites recently, but his whole body of work revolves around Trinitarian theology and particularly the the, the personal love that the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have for each other in this in this like super essential inexplicable love and personal love and he harps on that frequently like when you start when you have his book for example on the trinity that's up that's a main point of topic there mm -hmm. uh, or main topic there and then you then you go into the um dogmatics volume one and he starts to lay out the basic epistemology of um how we understand reality he always relates it back to the love that the persons have for each other and then man as created by God so that he could have more children to love. But at the same time, he doesn't want to relate. God, the father does not want to relativize God, the son. He wants his son and mm -hmm. his first love to be the son. So he, he doesn't make more. He posts this via the essence. He makes us created from nothing. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, because we are not God, uh, to, according to essence, he gives us that choice, whether or not we want to assimilate uh, to his love uh, his pre-eternal love or not. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to the idea of love your neighbor, love your enemy, um, you know, a lot of people, they first come across that and they, it comes off because kind of hokey, you know, you get the kind of Jehovah's Witness, Jesus, like Mr. Aryan, Nestorian, Mormon Jesus on the TV where they have like the dude in the artwork, just like an, like an insipid hippie there. Right. But when you really understand it, like no love, you need to love your neighbor. You need to love your enemies. It's a, it's like an ontological command. Like you have to heal this. You have to heal this universe I gave you and you do it by loving everyone. 
Mm-hmm. And when that when that reality starts to dawn on you, that love and uh, feeling of happiness and tranquility for other people, it there is something slightly selfish in it, in the sense that oh, I'm I'm getting to actually enjoy reality as it's supposed to be. Like I'm partly doing it for myself. I don't want this poison in me. I mean, I'm doing it for you. I love you, but it's the sense that well, I'm doing it because this is my job. I mean, the whole world falls apart if I don't do that. You know, so it's yeah ruminating on that i would love to go deeper in his work i feel like i need to wait a little bit but yeah. he's uh even just that bit i think really st- st- uh, struck with, struck with me well yeah i think that's you, you're spot on with how um actually loving someone whether it's a neighbor or a friend a family member or an enemy changes them mm-hmm. right i think there's something about attention and how you uh use it's like a attention. virus in a way it's mm-hmm. like a, an infection a, a noetic infection right that you poison them with this holy poison, so to speak. And it's like this idea of, you know, flipping something that seems uh, hateful for something good. Right. But yeah, but yeah. Continue what you're saying. Well, I don't think it's, it's not something that you, once you start to have the intention to uh, love your neighbor and love your enemy as yourself, by the way, and as God loves you, like once you have the intention to do that, the facade that, you know, you can, people tell themselves, oh, I love my neighbor. Of course I love my enemy, you know, but that's a, it's a facade. It's not real, right? To actually really share love with an enemy or with a friend, you know, to actually do that is something that I think you, it's, it's, you, you can cultivate over time through working on your noose and cleaning and purifying your heart through following the commandments, right? And through God, you know, I don't know, but, you know, through the, mm-hmm. through the grace of God and through doing, you know, through working through it, you can do it and it's something you can cultivate and it heals you and them at the same time in a sense. But I, I guess the idea is that can, you can't will your own self to do that. You know, you can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to love my enemy now. I, I'm not, I didn't do it yesterday, but today I'm going to love my enemy because it's not real, you know, but you can, you can get there. You can work through it. And then I think it takes time. And uh, the more that, the more that you trust that process, the more it accelerates that time because it, it takes a long time to heal and work through this, these, these different types of things. But that's the goal. But I think I, I'm with you. That's that's the most profound thing, I think, is to to love your enemy, um, you know, as yourself. Um, and if you don't mind, send me a link to that that book mm-hmm. um, that you were talking about, the one we're done here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will you know, send me a link there because that's that's the I don't think it's ever really possible to uh, to understand what that means. But it is the uh, ultimate solution in a sense. Right. Yeah, it's love presupposes this creation. Right. It's is mystically part of God from all eternity. And that's, we try so hard to pin ourselves down, uh, pin our own reasonings on that and try to express it. It does go back to the whole thing of beauty, right? The theme of allowing beauty to just, to just manifest Mm -hmm. something sporadic, complex, uh, almost seemingly self-assembling in a way, but it is allowing the, allowing this light to pour in and liturgize everything around us. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah. And it's like you said, trusting the process, having one foot on the gas, guiding it in a way, but at the same time, letting it, letting it happen in a yeah. very spontaneous way. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head again. I think beauty is a tool is not, not just a tool, but it, it is integral to this of, of idea of, of how to love, how to love your neighbor and, and to love everyone is, is through this idea of beauty and kind of reorient ourselves, reorienting ourselves to the notion of beauty in the world. And then, you know, that can make a lot of things. Beauty seems to like, uh, you know, kinds of kinds of it, it coheres the hierarchy in a sense, because all this stuff that, you know, I love science in a sense, I've always loved science and there's a lot of Same. beauty in science and mathematics and whatnot, but um, it, it kind of gets lost as everything's so kind of disintegrating. Um, I think and then the book, uh, the hierarchy of heaven and earth, the kind of ultimate theme of it is to, you know, you take the, the diminution we've gone from the, the beauty to the, from the, from the beautific vision to focusing on the good in terms of humanism to the true, which in terms of science, right. It's like, you take all that and incorporate it and just turn the focus back around and you incorporate, you know, from the true where we're at now, you know, the hyper-focused on materialism to the good, right? And then to the beauty again. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's the flip that Jonathan talks about, I think, right? So all of yeah. these things that seem so, uh, 
you know, so, uh, you know, cl clinical or, or sanitary in a sense, like the, sci the scientific method in a sense, all of these things, if you can incorporate beauty into them, that's, uh, that's the key, man. So, and, and really it seems intuitive too, at the scientific method, because you, you never question that presupposition, right? Because I think the scientific method, if I had to, to lay it out, it would go something like, you know, you, you, you intuit something and then hypothesize on it. Um, forgive me if this isn't exactly accurate. It's been a while since I studied this, but you uh, hypothesize something, you begin to lay out a plan to uh, reproduce it or to test that hypothesis, you can say document it and then be able to provide the ability for that to be reproduced right under uh, similar circumstances. But then you never question that first step, like, well, you form a hypothesis. How, how, how do you go about doing that? that? That does seem like some kind of beauty or artistic inspiration that you have that then use your tools of logic, philosophy, and uh, understandings of things to bring that intuition into fruition in a way. And yeah. a lot of people, they don't, they tend to forget that. Like when we talk about science uh, on both sides, you know, the people who on scientism, the who worship science as their own cultish religion and those who purely artistic types who go against it. I feel that that is another point of contact that people don't really think about too much. Yeah, I think that it's a good point. Like, where does the inclination to study a certain thing to, to form the hypothesis? Where mm -hmm. does that come from? Like, you know, I'm, in, I'm interested in, in philosophy, right? But most aren't interested in philosophy, but they're interested in something else, which I'm not interested in. And you don't choose what you're interested in. It kind of chooses you in a sense. It's like a yeah, calling. Exactly. And I think the same thing is, is, is to be said about, um, about being a scientist and having a, an insight that poses a question that, exactly. um, that would, where you would now, now engage with the natural world to, you know, to explicate and, and find the answer potentially to the question that you have. Um, yeah, I think, I think the, we're at a place just like the physicist um, now has to, you know, kind of find out that he has to put himself in the equation in terms of the way that, uh, you know, particles mm -hmm. behave either like a particle or wave, depending on the apparatus, depending on the, the um, observer in a sense. So it's like we're being forced to recapitulate and to reorient the human being in the center. Right. Um, and I think we're at the, the beginning of that process. And I think it's just, we're still coming to terms with, with, with what that means. Um, but it's, it's, it's encouraging, you know, with all of what's happening in the world in a sense and having conversations like this and being able to share insights and, and share, uh, you know, kind of perspectives like this gives me mm -hmm. hope. And I have a lot of hope from this conversations that, that we have. Um, and I'm very appreciative of it, man. So thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you for <laughs> allowing this to happen. It's yeah, man wonderful well we'll do it again yeah. um yeah we'll do it again here man i think we, we could talk for a while here maybe we'll start a little earlier next time um, yeah for sure yeah um yeah anything else that you want to leave us with man um everyone enjoy uh, have a blessed uh pentecost this weekend i guess i can say besides yeah, that man. i'm all good god bless and um why don't you make content man i mean you're i don't you should make some content especially if you're into uh you know uh making videos and editing uh, mm -hmm. So I think uh, your time is still to come if that's what you're interested in, because you have uh, you're very sharp. And for your age, I mean, uh, it's good to be in a state place of stasis. I, I kind of am, too. In a sense, the last month I've been in uh, like energy has been low, you know, in, 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 a, in a weird but not a bad sense. But I think mm -hmm. uh, I would follow that thread of uh, your initial passion there, because it's like the world is manifesting itself particularly for what you've been interested in for a long time. So uh, I'd encourage you, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to continue. Um, I'm currently, I'm working on something with Derek now, uh, uh, really relevant, I think, symbolic world video or video series, you can say. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been, we've been at that for a while. The topic has been bloating, but yeah, I would definitely, I should. <laughs> been meaning to get into that for a while. I mean, right now it's my channel mostly acts as, an archive for very just valuable orthodox gold mines that are hard to find and i just try to bring them together but yeah i can definitely at some point i should take a shot at it i for real but hopefully my pride won't get won't get get in the way and yeah man something good can come out of it i can help people we'll see yeah man for sure and uh, i guess lastly um 
I guess we, we talked about this earlier, I think it was yesterday mm -hmm. and Jonathan had a video um, about his work with uh, Noah. Did you, were you on that? Did you see that? Oh, his on the cosmic mountain when he was yeah. explaining it. I tried to, yeah, I, I showed up for a bit of it. I couldn't, my donation can't go through for some reason, Jonathan, he doesn't want my money, I guess. Really? <laughs> There's a glitch on YouTube probably. Yeah. So I, uh, I brought up the idea of a symbolic yeah. world group, like an embodied mm -hmm. symbolic world for him. And he was all about it. And he said that, uh, you know, Richard Rowland is working on something like that. So uh, I brought that up. I, I couldn't give you credit because there's only 150 characters. So I kept rewording it. I'm like, uh, you know, from our conversation of talking through that. Um, oh, the symbolic I, world meetup, you mean? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, hey, let's do I that. He, he was, he's totally down. He said, now that, you know, he's still in the midst of COVID up there in, in Canada uh, in yeah. terms of like craziness. Um, and what else did, what did I um, say there? It came from kind of, it was from our conversation and whatnot, but yeah, check it out. And uh, that would be cool, man. And um, we'll sh mm -hmm. we should do this again soon. I'd like to get, you know, some, some feedback on your experience at the trad forum and, and kind of get into that some more as well. Oh yeah, for real. Let's uh, should definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right, dude. Well, thank you, man. Thank you for your time. I got to go put the, uh, the kiddos to bed. Uh, I appreciate you. God bless. Oh, thanks for having me again. Yeah, man. See it.